ever been a child is familiar with the ultimate parental mic drop. To stop any discussion, eliminate any dissent, and to exercise complete control, your parents would hit you with a, because I said so. Well, once upon a time, there was a gentleman named Dr. Ferdinand Piech, and he said, so. See? More specifically, he said that Volkswagen would be the world's first manufacturer to put a one liter car into production. That's one liter of fuel every 100 kilometers. And he wasn't wrong. It didn't matter that the resulting contraption was a carbon-tubbed, mid-engine, semi-tandem, two-seat, butterfly door, $150,000, 68-horsepower, two-cylinder diesel that couldn't keep up with a 15-year-old Honda. Which sounds like it's a big problem, but trust me, it wasn't. And if you ask me why, the answer is because I have said so. This video is brought to you by the Haggerty Drivers Club, which includes a subscription to our award-winning magazine, 24-7 flatbed roadside assistance, and far more. Join or get more info at the link below. The year was 2002, and battery technology hadn't yet matured enough to allow fully electric vehicles. Ish. So the idea that a car could use zero fuel remained mostly a fantasy. Instead, Volkswagen concentrated on the next lowest number. One. One liter per 100 kilometers, or roughly 235 miles per gallon. It was an impossibility, or rather would have been except that Dr. Ferdinand Pieck did not believe in the impossible. What he did believe in, though, was publicity stunts. And in 2002, he drove a prototype one-liter car to a shareholder meeting 140 miles away. It was a rickety little cigar-shaped thing, a 640-pound carbon-wheeled tandem two-seater with a fighter jet canopy all painted in the exciting shade of death. It bore an unmistakable resemblance to the first car ever to wear PX mother's maiden name, Porsche, the 1939 Type 64. The one liter prototype had a monoblock engine and transmission that contained both a six speed automated manual and a single cylinder 299 cc diesel that made all of eight and a half horsepower. But thanks to its tiny size and little bitty drag coefficient, it did 75 miles an hour. And Piach arrived having used just 2.1 liters of fuel. That means he managed 264 miles per gallon, well under the unachievable one liter mark, on public roads no less. That sent a message. And seven and a half years later, Volkswagen sent another message when it proved it was still working on its one liter car taking the wraps off of the L1. Compared to PX stunt car, it was a third heavier, but its little diesel nearly tripled in displacement. Now 800 cc, it was a two cylinder with a turbo and a hybrid system, and it made real power. It had a lot more speed, even though the drag coefficient had also risen. But despite it having an extra gear and another clutch in its transmission, it couldn't quite hit that one liter per hundred mark. It hit 1.38 liters per 100 kilometers, or just 170 miles per gallon. This is a very rare failure for Dr. Pieck. And a bit of an embarrassment. A month before Volkswagen showed the L1, General Motors had announced that its new Chevy Volt could do 230 miles on a gallon. That wasn't exactly apples to apples. The Chevy Volt is primarily an electric car that uses power from the mains. Once the battery is depleted, well then the range extender kicks in and burns gasoline. General Motors was using guidance from the EPA that suggested that on most days, most people didn't travel far enough to fully deplete the battery. But if you zoom out and look long term, they would use a gallon of gasoline about every 230 miles. About, therefore, 230 miles per gallon, or one liter per hundred. Mm. 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 
So what the EPA and therefore GM was saying is that the Volt didn't actually have to get amazing gas mileage to get a rating of amazing gas mileage. In fact, it didn't. The Volt only scored 37 EPA miles per gallon once the battery was dead. But this would be a path for Piek to finally get what he wanted. And we saw VW's rushed plug-in response barely a year later when the L1 grew into the XL1. The Concept XL1 was now a plug-in hybrid and could go up to 20 miles on electricity alone using a far larger 27 horsepower motor. However, its weight ballooned and it more than doubled in mass. Since the XL1 no longer needed to actually achieve 235 miles per gallon, it no longer needed that fully tandem seating. It could grow wide enough to seat the occupants alongside one another. Sort of. And the outside no longer looked like Uncle Porsche's very first car. However, the seating arrangement almost identically mimicked that of the 1939 Type 64. That massive increase in width expanded aerodynamic frontal area by 50%, but the drag coefficient dropped slightly, and thanks to the 20 mile zero emission head start built in, EU testing resulted in just 0.9 liters per 100 kilometers. It took two more years, but finally, in 2013, the Volkswagen XL1 went into production as the world's first one-liter car. Dr. Piek said so, and he meant it. Although he never meant it to be a plug-in hybrid, so this enormous monstrosity of a 50-pound charger was an afterthought. Very bulky, very heavy afterthought. And the whole thing was expensive. The media had long estimated the one liter car's price to be 40,000 euro. But when the XL1 finally debuted, it cost almost three times that. This was a $150,000 car. VW built just 200 XL1s for the public. That is fewer than half as many Bugatti Veyrons as it made. And like the Bugatti Veyron, the XL1 is made almost completely out of carbon fiber in an obsessive quest for lightweight. It has a carbon fiber monocoque weighing just 194 pounds. Bolt-on aluminum crash structures front and rear bring the total up to just 240 pounds. Volkswagen pointed out that this body weighed no more than a big motorcycle's. The body panels are also carbon fiber. The seat backs are carbon fiber. Its brakes are carbon ceramic. The wheels are forged magnesium. The dashboard is made from molded wood pulp, just 1.4 millimeters thick. There is no sound insulation. For weight savings, it doesn't even have a passenger airbag. Then again, why would it? The seat is so far away from the dash that it's just not necessary. And it's not adjustable, so I couldn't get closer if I wanted to. <clears throat> the windows are polycarbonate. The doors open skyward, but have pyrotechnic explosive devices built in, should the XL1 roll. Not that it's likely to, because it's the same height as a Lotus Elise. And lighter. At just 1,800 pounds, there's no need for power steering, especially given the 115 section front tires. These things are narrower than a Vespa's tire. <laughs> so cute. What wasn't done in the interest of weight savings and rolling resistance was done to minimize aerodynamic drag. The rear track is a foot narrower than the front for that desirable teardrop shape. There are no rear view mirrors. Mirrors cause excess drag. In their place, cameras out here and screens in here. The image is incredibly clear and sharp, HDR'd, and the camera's resolution is twice what the then new iPhone retina screen could display. Getting used to the camera-based side view mirrors is actually not all that difficult. But in what must be the best example of missing the forest for the trees, this thing has two cameras for side mirrors, but no backup camera. And the backup camera became required by law only a couple of years after this thing was made. It also has no rear view mirror because it has no rear window to see through. And so driving this car forward is fine. Backing this thing into a parking space is possibly the scariest thing you will ever do in a car. 
but the arrow tweaks worked. The drag coefficient was just 0.189. Combined with the tiny frontal area, the CDA, or the effective frontal area, is tiny, just three square feet. When we look at the front of the XL1, we see oh, well, that. When the wind looks at the front of the XL1, it appears to be only this big. Meaning, this car needs only eight horsepower to cruise at 62 miles an hour on a flat road. And the engine makes way more than that. Hidden down there somewhere is a 360 degree parallel twin, which means it's the center two cylinders of a four cylinder. In this case, Volkswagen's 1.6 liter turbocharged intercooled direct injected diesel. The pistons move up and down together, so thankfully they're balanced out with a gear driven balance shaft. Displacement, 829 cc's, horsepower, 47. That combines with a 27 horsepower electric motor for a total system output of 68 horsepower, all sent through a lightweight magnesium case seven speed dual clutch transmission. It can run on electricity at up to 87 miles an hour and thanks to the five and a half kilowatt hour battery can travel 30 miles emission free. The crazy part is this XL1 is genuinely awesome to drive. Think the world's slowest Lotus Elise with three extra helpings of noise because a carbon tub doesn't make a quiet cabin. The suspension is bolted directly to the tub so it all kind of reverberates and a two cylinder diesel is um, a two cylinder diesel. But the suspension is tuned perfectly. The manual steering is perfectly communicative and wonderful. And this thing generates ridiculous amounts of grip despite those skinny little tires. If there's one big bitch, it's that it's hot as hell in here no matter what. And it does have air conditioning, but it can't keep up on a 75 degree day. If you want to open the windows, there's a cute little crank over here, but they don't open all that much. And once you're moving, the wind buffeting will blow out your brain drums. And chiefly, it did what Dr. PX said it would. The final rating was below the one liter mark, even if it took advantage of the rulebook to achieve that number. Without plugging it in, running just on diesel hybrid power, the XL1 returned 2.7 liters per hundred in EU testing. That's 87 miles per gallon combined, which is a bit better than it does in the real world. Think 70s miles per gallon, which is unbelievable mileage unless you're talking to the owner of a first generation Honda Insight. This was similarly teardrop shaped and it was made out of entirely conventional materials like aluminum, not carbon fiber. And yet it weighed the same as the Volkswagen XL1. Under the hood, it used a regular old three cylinder gas engine, naturally aspirated, no tricks, with a tiny little battery and a tiny little motor. And it still scored 65 miles per gallon EPA combined which means the inside could very nearly match the XL1's MPG performance for one seventh the price, 15 years earlier. Oh, and the XL1 had another small problem. Well, one that looks like an enormous problem sitting right next to it, but that is a compact car. And it's also a Volkswagen. And it doesn't use 0.9 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. It uses no fuel ever. Because it's electric, Insult to injury, Volkswagen's own e-Golf went into production a month before the XL1 did. It cost a fifth as much, carried two and a half times as many passengers, and 10 times the luggage. This to say nothing of the other, even more advanced EVs that were already in production when these two started. Things like, for example, the Tesla Model S. Meaning the XL1 became fully obsolete in the 12 long years between Piech saying so and it becoming so. That may sound like a bad thing, but it proved that when Ferdinand Piech said something was gonna happen, it was going to happen. And it needs to be said that this will likely go down in the history books as the most efficient internal combustion car ever made. And certainly one of the coolest cars ever to grace planet Earth, if for no other reason than because I said so.